Well, it's a great pleasure for me to be introduced by Abid. I think that's, that's a very, very nice piece of serendipity. But also, as you can see, I have been a very busy sort of academic doing academic things. But I'm really coming to this enthusiasm through my role as a, a citizen and as a resident of my community. And that's how I've come in to discover this whole world of civil society enterprise. That's not quite true because I was involved in a project with uh, Frank Moulet and various others, which also involved Kevin Morgan from, from, he, from this area. And he did a few cases of what, what he calls social innovation. But really, what I'm finding myself is, as a citizen and resident, I'm finding myself involved in civil society enterprise, one I'm very centrally involved in. I have to admit the bias, I'm currently the chair of it. And I was only chair of it. Maybe I have to start with a story. I, I knocked on the door about five years ago when they were looking for more trustees, and I said, would you like, I think I might have, you were looking for people with experience in urban regeneration and strategic planning. I might be able to help here. And they said, oh, yes, we want you. We need more women. So <laughs> that was the first thing. And then I hadn't been there. And of course, I'm not a person e easily able to keep quiet. So I was trying to be polite and respectful and listen carefully. But after a year and a half, they said, you know, we really think you ought to be the next chair. And, and unfortunately, I, I, that's, I, 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 for some various reasons, I, I did accept this. But I, luckily, my chairship finishes in July, so I will be able to escape a little. But it has been an extraordinarily interesting experience. So hopefully you've got some sense of the biases, why I've, I've got involved in this. Now, I think one of the most interesting things, what are these civil society enterprises? We've been talking in some of the discussions, civic, civil, what is this about? And just all kinds of things are going on under this. Community energy projects, arts and sports facilities, quite a lot of affordable housing projects. And you can go back in time, and before it was called social housing, you've got things like arms houses. Still little, little, a little kind of trusts have been going on, managing these things for 100 years, 150 years, even longer. Social enterprises, then we run, we run a youth hostel. Um, uh, another trust in Northumberland has a very successful chocolate factory. Um, there's uh, people run laundries, various, all ki kinds of enterprises. Community centres, a lot of, lot of uh, civil society enterprises are running community centres. Business premises, um, I'll talk about my own trust and also another one is actually off with small scale business, small businesses spaces, affordable for, 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 for micro businesses, artists, etc. And quite a lot are in the field of, of social welfare provision, social care, uh, care for the elderly, and, and quite a few also with young people, young pe troubled young people, so there's a whole p lot of them. So there are lots, there are a whole variety of kinds of enterprises. I, I, and I perhaps should have put more environmental projects down there as well as the energy projects, because there's a lot of kind of community farms and other, other alternative uh, enterprises there. Well, now I'm going to make a very bold kind of academic sort of statement. When I try to think, well, what is this civil society? Lots of different definitions of it. But back in the late 1970s, I read a, a, a very useful book by sociologist John Arry, who's gone on to do lots of other things. And he, picking up from a fine Marxist sociological tradition, said, well, you can think about society as having three spheres which overlap. So here am I, a citizen of civil society. I make use of, of government services, and I, I, I do pay taxes, actually, so I'm contributing to the economy, and I'm buying stuff. So each individual person is in all of these. But it's rather helpful to look at it in this way. If we were back, and my colleague, fellow trustees, because you can see I'm quite an old person, and some of the other people who become involved in this kind of thing tend to be, have got into retirement, semi-retirement. Um, that, that we sort of remember, we look back in time. But some of us look back in the middle of the 19th century. There was a lot of civil society activity as people were trying to deal with all the consequences of this rapid industrialization. But then slowly, and the big struggles, the trade union struggles, the struggle, struggle of the labor movement said, we want a bigger government. Government should be responsible for many more of these things. So we grew in our country and many other European countries, a welfare state providing all sorts of services. So the state grew big, and there was a lot of discussion as to how the state related to the economy. And I think maybe what we feel at the moment is, and now we've let the economy grow big, and between the two of them, the state and the economy, civil society 
was feeling itself a little bit drowned, I think, crowded out. Um, there was a discussion in the 1980s, I remember, which, where it was used to be said, we've got to reduce the state. It's crowding out economic initiative. I don't know if some of you remember that, that vocabulary. Well, I think you could almost say that the state economy was actually had, had until recent, was, was fine crowding out civil society initiative. And one of the most interesting, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, but one of the most interesting manifestations of that was in the 1970s, there were very substantial movements. Maybe some people were quite involved in that um, in, uh, to, to find alternative ways, alternative economy movements, and alternative ways of doing politics. And there was a lot of emphasis, can we try cooperatives? A cooperative movement was growing there, building alternative social enterprises. There's not very many of those initiatives which managed to survive through the 80s to the 90s. So it's an interesting question because they were being crowded out by all the kind of regulations and, and the reorientations that were happening. Anyway, that, that's a hypothesis. Perhaps we need, need to be looked more carefully. Anyway, uh, wh what I think is interesting, what I, I'll come back to a hypothesis. Is it the case that these civil society initiatives are actually at this present moment expanding? And what is that saying about what's happening elsewhere? So come back to that. Well, back to a bit more definitions. Civil society enterprise, don't think that there's a single definition. There are diffuse category, cooperatives, social enterprises. People call them various things, sometimes just like community development. In some, an article I wrote trying to explain to some people, and actually for a journal that was published in Asia, would you believe it, they were interested in, very much interested in this sector. And I wrote about what I could discover about the British experience enterprises and projects which develop from the sphere of civil society. A, a Dutchman, um, Henk Wagenaar, who's got very interested in the Dutch significance, the, the, the Dutch developments, where they have had a very substantial welfare state, which has been providing everything, which now can't actually pr provide all that. So he's, a, he, he's, he's defined these enterprises produce social goods in a democratic way. Now that's a very interesting question because I'll come to some examples and think, well, how democratic are these re uh, really? And then in the work of Frank Roulette and others, he would refer to these social innovation because they're providing for social needs rather than for, for profit or for some policy uh, requirement. So there's three hypotheses here. I don't know the answer to these. There's some academics here around. Maybe there's some academics, this is a university after all, who perhaps should start researching these quite carefully. But I've just said the first, is this an expanding activity? Is there more of it going on? Is it an expression of the neoliberal project? And if anybody's been reading any kind of political science, social science literature, you've heard it must be impossible to ignore the neoliberal project. I think it's even in the newspapers these days, which I'm afraid I, I don't read the newspapers, so I read... Uh, the, I read The Economist and I watch a BBC television whilst, as an old person, I do my exercises. That, <laughs> that's, that seems to be... That, so that's how I, I, I get a sense of what's discussed in daily life. But anyway, the idea of the neoliberal project, it's saying that it's the, 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 it's, it's a kind of idea, the, philo the, the, the political philosophy, that the problem with our, our whole society and our governance system is the state's grown too large, it's inefficient, it's, it's, it, what we need to do is to make, create more space for the market and downsize the state. So it's essentially reducing the role of the state, encouraging the role of the market, with a few add-ons to say, and by the way, what about the big society? This worries us a lot. I, you may remember the, the, the rhetoric of the big society, which has sort of faded now. But every now and then we say, are we being the big society? And I have, a, I have an answer to this question, which I may remember to tell you. <laughs> that, is, that is not how we... Or, and this is the Frank Roulette argument, but also I think many others in the sector feel it, who are what operate in this area. Are we pioneering alternative approaches to state and market? If that's what's happening. So we've got these kind of three, three hypotheses. Well, that's a sort of general introduction to what we're talking about. Let's get a little bit more specific. How have these civil society enterprises, where have they come from? You know, what have they popped up out of? It's, it's just that people get together and say, let's do something. Usually there's some kind of motivation, some kind of, of movement, social movement, some kind of idea behind it. And I think among the most interesting 
are some of the, the philanthropic movements, particularly in the 19th century, some of the charitable foundations which were set up then. The churches were really important. And I put just one because it's nearby where I am, a small housing project, I think it's about 24 rental units run by, I think they, it's, it's run entirely by one of the people who, is the, 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 who, who rents one of the units, so he's a caretaker for the rest. Very, very efficient, very effective. The rents are very low. They have very few low maintenance costs, it seems. And they've been going since the 1920s. It was a project for war veterans. So I think actually after the First World War, that quite a lot of, it, of these enterprises were set up like that. There's another swathe which are around at the moment which have come from urban regeneration initiatives. I put the Coin Street community builders. Some of us may, be, may, may remember the days of Coin Street back in the 1970s, which arose in protest against big-scale uh, speculative redevelopment uh, uh, of, of uh, inner, inner London, just the other side of the river, uh, sort of in the area near Waterloo, Waterloo Station, I think. Is, so it's a really, you know, it's, it's astonishing that it is still there, it owns quite a bit of property, it's, and it runs a number of different enterprises. They did get a great deal of support, actually, from Ken Livingstone at the time when he was the leader of the Greater London Council, and, and which supported these kind of enterprises. But more common, uh, Nick Bailey has written, a, has done an account of the, their, a variety of initiatives that he's seen arising from urban regeneration policies, particularly of the 1990s. There were those under the, the Tory administration until 97, and 97 afterwards it was under a Labour administration. But there was this whole sequence of various initiatives which set up uh, various projects in neighbourhoods. And the Shoreditch Trust, I've just picked up as one, that was uh, established as a trust in 1998. It came through a New Deal for Communities project, in, which is, I don't know if it applies in Wales, but it was an English project. And it was providing specially to encourage the employability of uh, and, uh, employment and social skills for marginalised groups. That, that, that was its focus. And there are a great number like that. And some others which are more like the Coin Street, they've gone into regeneration. Then there are housing cooperatives. And I looked carefully in Bristol, actually, to have a look. I was sure that I'd be finding some housing cooperatives to be found in Bristol. And found one in Bath, which actually started off as squatter. They, put, they were squatting, and then they, they, they were at the, the, the council, I think, in the Bath area, decided that it was better well to let them have the property. That solved that problem, which was getting rather aggravating. So they then subsequently were able to acquire four cheap properties, and now they're looking to do a bit more, just a few properties as a cooperative. Very interesting is another one, which is not just a, a, a mutual ownership society, but it's, it's built from straw bales and is a, a mutual community. I think there's a number of 24 units very cleverly worked out so that everybody has a bit of equity, so if they leave, they can take the equity with them. But the whole idea is that you don't get into the speculative gain as a result of rising land value costs. So that's another one. Environmental movement, there are so many that I, I, I how to select. So I'm just selecting one that I came to know recently in Cheshire. It's, it's in the, uh, I think it's within commuting distance of Chester. So you can imagine a village in commuting distance of Chester, I'll explain a little bit more, whose project was to lower the carbon footprint of the village to neutral. Then we've got uh, quite a number in social care provision, and I'll talk more about Bellevue Resource Centre in Northumberland, but that's providing a gap, particularly around elderly services, when something closed and they, uh, and, and they felt that they, that they had to struggle to, to provide alternative provision. Then another one from a, from a city, where again it's, it's a bit like a coin street, but coming quite a lot later, protest against the activities of an urban development corporation. And finally, um, my own, which I'm involved, the Glendale Gateway Trust in, in, in Northumberland, which really, I put it, said it's actually just a react, reacting to the slow neglect and down, downscaling of activity in a village as a result of agricultural depopulation. So I think anybody who knows about rural areas, the, the farming population was, was ebbing away. Young people were leaving, and all the businesses were, were sort of, the, the high street was looking pretty woebegone. And, but anyway, I'll come on to the story of that in due course. So we've got 
the, these different activities coming from lots of different backgrounds. And I think that if anybody's interested in doing research, it would be really interesting to have a look more systematically at an area and see the range and what's, what's promoted them and what, why some have kept going and why some haven't. But I also think there have been certain waves. It's not just that they pop up. There are waves of encouragement. And I think quite this 19th century period, early 20th century, was one such wave before we got the, the, the whole of paraphernalia of, of what became the welfare state developing. After the war, the First World War, with uh, provision for war veterans, some of whom you can see there were housing problems and health problems, all kinds of difficulties. But then the next time we notice a, a, a movement, as I was mentioning, the 1970s. And I think many of us were very aware of that time as a time of, of radical alternatives. But it's quite clear that the, 19, the 1990s and the 2000s have been, were very important. And at a particular time, some of it has been to do to the protest, but a lot was due to, to state initiative. So there's the state coming in and saying, let's empower civil society, I'm putting it very firmly in that way round, um, let's empower civil society. And one of the characteristics of those, and it's very clear in Nick Bailey's uh, urban regeneration study, that when he looks at these urban regeneration ones, that very often a key, um, a key factor in getting things off the ground and getting them going was a paid, somebody paid with government money to take that initiative. Now, this is interesting because then you have what happens when that worker is no longer there because the money's gone away. So I think there's a whole, well, there's a whole discussion, but a whole other area. What has survived from all of that? What has actually imploded? And quite a lot, we're quite aware in Northumberland, very strong initiative uh, up the Tyne Valley in our area, which was doing, uh, uh, running a, a community centre, doing various other things, was doing a lot of development activity. The money went away. The innovative person disappeared. And now all there is is a half-time half clerk, and she just takes who wants to run the to activities in the various buildings. She has no time, and it's not her background to do development initiatives. So that kind of implosion may happen. So we call it the period of, when we're talking about it, we, we talk about the period, especially from 1997 onwards, as the period of the funding feast. It wasn't actually just the Labour government putting lots of funding into these different kinds of initiatives because they, they, they were in, into the localism game, and that was part of the rhetoric, whilst they were, of course, centralising. That, that's always been... But the English state seems to have been unable to escape this, this little tension. But it was also a time uh, when the, the charities, they hadn't, until you get to 2000, 2008, and the economic crisis, they had substantial funds coming into their, uh, into their pockets, which they were putting into, into their charities, I shouldn't say pockets, into their charities, uh, to fund all kinds of initiatives. Uh, in our area, our particular problem was the Northern Rock Foundation was very useful, which, of course, kind of collapsed. <laughs> and that was a bit of a problem. And, uh, yes. and then we've got the 2010s, which is a different thing, a funding famine, but an energetic promotion. So this is a rather bizarre. And also, at the same time, very substantial cuts in social care. So creating gaps and spaces, which creates the sort of neglects that motivate its attention. So we've had these waves of innovation. Now, I, I, I sort of, my habit has always been to tell store narratives about particular examples. So I'll try very quickly, without keep, keeping it out of the time, to tell three little stories of three, um, of three different kinds of trusts. And I've only picked them out because I'm familiar with them and I know something about them. There are probably many others. You, many of you may know of similar stories or something which would tell something different. But the Usburn Trust, is, is, is in, in Newcastle, and Abby may remember it, that, it's, that there's this, it, it lies, it's a steep-sided valley that lies between the city centre and, the, and, and one of the poor wards, the east end of Newcastle. And the, the political ward boundary actually goes down the river in the valley. So it had no, no, it, it, it had no profile, wasn't noticed at all, mostly derelict industrial properties, but rather curious. And then the roads went straight across the top, if you can see in the distance, you might see uh, bridges going, going across the top. Well, the first thing that happened was along came the Development Corporation uh, in 1998, and their job was to renovate the waterfront. And this valley goes straight down into the waterfront. So the, a few pioneers, cheap, interesting, you know, people looking for alternatives, moved in and picked up. And they've got premises, and little companies here, and urban farms started up, and the stables turned up, little things popped up. 
But then along came these proposals for the regeneration of the waterfront, which have pretty much happened now. And this river, this valley, suddenly the people who'd like this attractive valley thought, you're blocking our ex your exit. And who knows that that uh, increase in land values will come back and completely upset this interesting uh, low-cost dynamic of this little valley. So they, they formed a protest group. And I remember, because I was on the board of the Development Corporation at the time, the East Quayside Protest Group. Um, and they, they, they protested. And the city council at that time was, was always a little bit ambiguous about the Development Corporation. It wanted what it did, but it wanted to oppose it because it was a political uh, configuration. So they, they, they gave some support to this trust, this, this group, and eventually they suggested that they form a charitable trust. And with the charitable trust, the city council could then transfer some, some of this derelict property had ended up in the city council ownership, and there were some pieces of derelict land. And I think maybe even when you were there, it was a kind of pretty much, a, you know, 10 years ago, 12 years, 15 years, it pretty much a, a derelict area. Now we had a visitor to, 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 to Newcastle, um, uh, to the university uh, from Germany, and he went down, and he, it's a lovely area, lots of nice pubs, cafes, distinctive character, um, walkways going through, and with adher tourist heritage, and the, there's a special, special tunnel, all kinds of heritage left over from the industrial period, which are now attracting lots of visitors, so it's now become a recognised place on the tourist itinerary, and people go there in the evenings to drink there as well and, and enjoy life. Uh, the struggle for the Usborne Trust is very interesting, starting in protest, moving into partnership with the City Council, full of ambiguities, which I'll kind of mention a bit later on, creating a place where previously it had been invisible to the outside world, creating a place, but now they, they had actually 2.5 million for in the, during the funding feast, so about 1998 they got that to help renovate some of the property. But now they have to pay attention. How are we going to survive into the future? We've got to think about our asset base. Our asset base is the rents we're getting from the renovated property. We need a housing project so we can get rents from that, rent, um, rents from businesses. So they're thinking, where is the financial state of sustainability for our future? They've got quite clever ways of thinking about it. Well, that's a regeneration trust. Bellevue Resource Centre did start from protest, but a sort of micro-protest. There was a workhouse which had become a sheltered housing project. And the, uh, I think it was the county council, I felt that it was no longer economic, it was very small, so they closed it. And naturally, I mean, when that happens, it, it is a really a terrible thing because people's living there, because people's relatives are there, and it's been in the community. So it, it was a terrible wrench, so a lot of protest. And gradually, they thought, well, okay, it's going to be closed, what are we going to do next? And the outcome of that was the formation of a charitable trust, which now run, uh, and the, 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 the building was transferred to the trust and the site. So they got that. Uh, on, on part of the site were some four or five uh, units, especially for older people. And the, the, the workhouse now provides uh, community services, a daycare centre for older people, a cafe and things like that. They have a community transport, which is not volunteer, actually. It's very interesting. They say, we've, this, this has got to be professional. We've got to have paid people who are skilled community transport people to take people with from all over quite a wide area, with, with perhaps with dementia or with some mobility problems, to the centre. And they've just started a very uh, a daycare service. And their, their philosophy, which I, I, I always find very inspiring, is that their philosophy is, philosophy is in a rural area with a complex geography, we can provide everything more efficiently and a better quality service because we know our geography and we know our area and we know how to help. That's really, and, and, and it's working extremely successfully. So, so that's, that, that's a, a social care example. And Ashton Hayes, Hayes going carbon neutral it seems, that, which I already mentioned, and you can see that there doesn't seem to be a house at all. In, these are pictures from their website. This is a sports, the building below is a sports pavilion, and now there's a cafe there, and they're hoping to open a pub soon and, and, and various other things. But they, it, was, it seems like a group of people interested in environmental issues with some time on their hands. They were people with resources, actually, who said, we've got to do something, and they formed themselves into a band of volunteers, moved in on the parish council, so it became part of the parish council, they got the legi le their legitimacy, and they launched the project uh, in 2006, and I think 
by the 2011-12, they've managed to cut emissions by, and I think I've got the figure right, by 25%. And they're still working on it. And now, moving out into wider areas, they're working on a neighbourhood plan. In a way, they've built up this, this capacity. Well, those are some examples, and I'm going to now have a look at three questions. I think I put in the outline that that's what we... First of all, from all these experiences, as I'm looking at them, and I, and I haven't been doing it systematically, so I do hope we have some more academic work in this area, which comes and looks at it system more systematically. What creates and sustains such initiatives? And for me, the ones that really keep going have a lot of have, have to come from something within. There has to be some grain of energy from inside a civil society source. Variously been talking about it. It's, it's no use really saying now we've we've got to sit here in government and we've got to encourage these organisations to pop up. They need that energy from underneath. For regional people, I have the same view about city regions. There has to be something in the region to pick up the energy. Otherwise, it'll fill. Uh, It'll just peter out, and it, or it'll replicate somebody's model that doesn't really belong. And that, that mobilisation can come from protest, um, from philanthropy. Uh, our, our own trust, one of the forces behind it was the Rural Community Council, um, who, and the representative on it ha happened to be a really good Welsh Christian socialist vicar. And uh, he still does his preaching. With a, with a fine West, West accent up in North Northumberland, so that's, uh, but but he had a very strong philanthropic commitment and also a, a commitment to what a what a communi community role should be. In our case, what really mobilised more people around that was perception of it's all sagging, it's neglected. What 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 can we do? And gradually something sparks that, or a response to a gov. It could be a response to a government initiative. And some of these NDCs, if we start, if we look at, at, at urban regeneration initiatives, it's quite interesting. Why was the initiative located there? And you scrape away and you find there was something else before it got to that point. So, and what they do is they create some kind of voice, a voice for an issue, a voice for a place, a gross voice for a community. And they, the mobilisation creates a sort of, through the focus of attention, a sort of energy. And it's the energy... Um, which is not an energy of a collection of individuals, but an energy of a people who feel together we can do things. And I'm astonished, much of the literature you read would suggest that perhaps that doesn't happen, but I'm astonished just how powerful that is. Um, in my own, uh, our own trust, people say, we're doing it for the benefit of the community. And you ask people to say, define community, you try and put it down into words or tick boxes, and it's best not. Nobody wants to put it, but they have this feeling. There's something sort of un, undefinable about we're doing it for our, all of us. We don't quite know who us are, but that's what we're doing it for. But having got to that point, before long, you have to make this really, really difficult step from enthusiasm and collective energy to an organisational form. Uh, talking with people in the Usburn Trust, that was a very difficult thing because they had activists coming from an alternative world who said, we don't want organisations, let alone you know, like government or money and things like that. A lot of tensions. And sometimes people have drifted away at that point as it begins to get that organisational form. But if it's going to carry on, it needs to have some, some kind of form. And the charitable, uh, many of these are charitable trusts or mutual home ownership associations. And you need a resource base. And the people are clearly a hugely important resource base. And that's all people from all sorts of areas sort of get mixed up together. Um, but, uh, but it could be vo volunteers, but it could be sometimes people who then come in to, to take paid roles if we've generated enough. Finance, fascinating to unpack. There's grants, I kind of mentioned. There's, if you've got assets, you can get rent from assets. Um, there's loans. Uh, we actually bank with Unity Trust, which is a bank set up around about, I was here, they, were, they came to visit us and they, they were set up in the, by the trade union movement with the cooperative in the late 1970s. And they have a philosophy too. They, we are, they say, a social enterprise. This is, this is really interesting. H how far we'll observe how far they really are like this. But another source of finance, which I believe is quite general outside of the northeast of England, but, but we did it for the first time in the north of e East England, 
we've been building some, we've been uh, converting some properties into flats, uh, apartments, I should say, <laughs> which are just about, I think the, the, they moved in just, uh, yesterday, no, no, Monday. Um, but we, we raised 120K from, uh, from the local community with bonds, three-year bonds with no interest. And, and it just, and that's because we, uh, of course, we've said, that you come and have a look at them. This is what you've helped to create. But there's more there um, that, than, what, than one might think. We, 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 um, I could talk a bit more about that. Well, I said I'd show, uh, quickly have a look at our own trust and just have a look at the evolution of funding. We, we got the mobilization started around 93, 94, and it was activated. There'd been one or two little attempts to get something going, but it was the Rural Community Council movement which had said, let's have some village appraisals. And I think some people from rural areas may have come across these village appraisals. Let's have some village appraisals in four communities and see if they can take off. So there was a little bit of money, which has all got actually from a special grant from the Bearings Fund just before Bearings Bank collapsed, if you may remember the story, <laughs> collapsed in, in scandal. So just managed to, you know, the timing is such a, you know, such a lot of luck in all of this. Anyway, the, the, this village appraisal process, uh, the, the, brought together a number of people discussing, and I remember sitting in a hall, because I've been in my area for 25 years, and, and listening to people discussing what they thought they'd like to happen. But they came to say, what we need is a community centre. We haven't got a proper community centre. And there's that old building, which used to be a workhouse, and had been the offices of the Glendale Rural District Council before it was merged to become Berwick District Council, before Berwick District Council was merged to become Northumberland County Council. So why don't we, and this is sort of pretty much vacant, why don't we uh, try to convert this building into a community centre? And for us, our idea of a community centre is for lots of people who use it for community activities, bringing people together, trying to overcome some of the problems of deep rural isolation, which some of you who are in that background will know just how isolated you can be on a remote farmstead. So do that. And maybe have a few, some of it for business units as well, for micro-businesses. I have to say, now our community centre uh, is... Uh, is almost covers all its costs and it employs 20 people, partly for the trust and partly in small businesses. And it's, it's really, but it's taken, that was the, the idea 1996, so we'll be sort of celebrating next year, 20 years. But we didn't really get there. You look at the, if you can read the bottom here. As you can see, the, the, the centre opened in this old workhouse in 2001, 2002. And we can't, I have, trying to get figures back, I can't do that. But if you look at the income from assets, the blue line, how little was the income that we were getting as rent from the Cheviot Centre? There's a peak where we, we were doing some work on a government grant on encouraging people in deployability skills, work web scheme. And that kind of made a bit of a dip and it's got cut. But if you look at the general trajectory, you can see it moves up. And by, this, by the time we're getting to, we acquired a youth hostel and we're getting, we get some return off the, the youth hostel, which helps to keep... Um, the, the, the development work of the trust going. We then have been moving particularly, we've got some commercial, we bought, this is a tall story, but we own some of the properties on the high street. That brings in a rental income. And now we have, um, two years ago, we had four housing units. Um, one year ago, we had nine. And us, we now have 18. It's a bit terrifying because we have to organise ourselves to manage 18. But, but you can see the impact of that on our, on our, on our, our income from assets. And our administrative costs have obviously gone up, but nothing like the same. Just have a look, though, at the green line below. That green line will go up because we've had to move into a borrowing uh, situation, but we can borrow against our assets. And we've so far got most of our assets are not encumbered. Some of them now are. So that's a very, it worries us a lot. We, we scratch our heads and say, are we all right? You know, it's okay. And I think that's so with many very, very small organisations, very little bit of money, every thousand pounds, every 500 pounds counts. And that's, a, that's the scale of it. It's like a micro business. So carrying on with the questions, what creates and sustains such initiatives? I don't want in any way to imply that all this could happen completely without a significant role from formal government. And I think it's very interesting question of what that role should be, how it should be developed. And I'd be really interested in how some people are thinking about that. But as we look at these examples, start-up resources, asset transfer. In our case, the, the building was transferred from Berwick District Council 
And you can see why they transferred the maintenance of it. And, and it, was a, it was a bother, an empty building. Why not transfer it? But a lot of technical and legal <laughs> advice. It's very terrifying at the beginning to get started. And you want to be able to call on people. Through European funding, Northumberland County Council has a wonderful couple of people who will give free advice on absolutely everything. So you're wondering how to write a job description for a new member of staff or you know, how to deal with it. We've got a real dis dis dispute here or how do we think about trustee skills? And, and they run away, we, we run a, have a strategic away day every year and they run those for us. So, so those kind of things. Smoothing pathways through bureaucratic tangles. You need a friend, you know, or every little needs a friend to say, we're having a terrible trouble with the transport planners, can you sort this out for us? Or sometimes it's conservation people, I'm just trying to pick up things that come, come across. But something, and I think some of us have kind of inve uh, invented this term, just like you know, small businesses come and go. If you were to look at the geography of the whole of Britain, and you would say some places are very rich in all these initiatives, some places are not. And it's no use sitting there and imagining across, if you're in a, in a, in a, in a, trying to think about social care provision or affordable housing provision, and imagine we can sit back and let these initiatives happen. There does need to be people looking around and saying, in that area, nobody is providing these services. We have to do it. There is, no, there is no other way. They can help us by cutting back our costs, but we have to remember our costs have got to go here. And I think that's, that means, in the end, all of the little enterprises have to, have to sign up to something of a redistributive agenda. You know, we've got to care for everybody. The caring for everybody is some part of the kind of narrative that needs to go with this. But there are tensions. Uh, we, what did I, you kept telling me stories. You know, at the beginning, you know, the politicians, they always wanted to say it was them that had made this wonderful thing happen, when actually it was us, <laughs> and that kind of thing. Or, uh, at the, from a case of Usburn, where the that the area is divided between two wards and we're having great difficulty because the ward councillors think, well, what's this doing on the edge of us? This is our area of concern and they're popping this all up and confusing us. And so you get difficulties with, with, with political difficulties. Competition actually over ownership. So getting shared ownership is quite important. And we do quite a bit say, oh, yes, we think we should buy. Maybe the vice chair of the council should come along to this because we say, isn't you, this is, you'll really be pleased to see this. So you do a little kind of how to help. No, I should have, I wanted to, to keep on with. But when we say what creates and sustains such an initiatives, it's an awful lot to do with making clever use and strategic use of the opportunities available and searching them out. You have to have that way. You can't just be hoping that something will turn up. Um, uh, that, that, that isn't going to help you. So you need not everybody, but some people in your initiative who've got that kind of strategic capability to be able to read the runes and see what's going to be happening and position in relationship to that. There's a lot of accident as well. but So we, we could, perhaps that's something we could actually discuss. How is governance capacity developed? People come in this field, people are coming from such a huge variety of backgrounds. It's a really interesting field. I occasionally come across a planner and um, quite a lot of people haven't got any academic background whatsoever. They've just dropped into it for one reason or another and found that was their skill, that was their interest. But it's very interesting how people talk about what they've learnt, learnt how to work with others, learnt how to manage finance, learnt how to think about design because the design of a community centre is, is actually really an important thing. So, and, and then they then use, how they then use that learning in the next step that they take. And uh, a capacity to manage resources, uh, manage, uh, to, to manage assets, but also networking. I think people talk, there's a kind of uh, word in political studies these days about network governance. And these organisations survive by the little ones, but they're usually connected into their communities and around and about to pull things together. There's a very interesting question about um, what happens. You start off with a group of people. 20 years later, what has happened to those people? Are they still there? In our trust, the person who is currently the director started as an activist, became a trustee, and then became an officer, and then, beca uh, then became a staff member, then became a director. And we haven't actually had any staff, we had one additional staff, but we haven't had any staff changes since 2008. Sort of, there's a little worry in my mind. 
the Usbon and the trustees, we have got a cycling process. So, you know, I, nine years for, for being on a trustee and a chair, and it, and your, a chair is only there for three years. So we've got that and uh, we brought in new people. But the, the Usbon Trust, meanwhile, has had been through various changes. So they've got a complete difference, one or two continuous people, but new staff, new trustees, and that's made a difference. So I think there's very interesting questions about that. And continual attention to reputation. And the reason for the reputation is exactly where does the legitimacy of these enterprises actually come from? How do you justify all this? Suppose, what the hell are you think? Excuse me. What do you think you're doing here? <laughs> well, perhaps I'm. Yes. Anyway, and I, in my own area, a very rural area, which is with a paternalist land, 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 land biggest estates. Um, that, so we, that the, our trust used to be known by the people in the parish council as, as the posh people's club. So, but now I think we're, we're, that, that we've got over that, that hump, but that was, that, that was there. Um, but, uh, but we, so we have to do something. Now, and that, maintaining the respect to the community and to be valued for what you've done and valued for the way you do it is absolutely central to the continuing le le legitimacy of those enterprises which do not have some formal link to the political system. Ashton Hayes carbon, going carbon neutral was okay because they had actually moved in, moved in, I think is what they did, to the parish council. The Charity Commission, many of these organisations like ourselves are registered with the Charity Commission which checks that you're not abusing finance, you know, you're not running off with the money. Um, which is always a fear that that might actually happen. But I think it's also interesting, back to the reputation is by what you deliver, that it's delivered of public value that people in the community value, and that you do it in a way that people in the community value, and that you become approachable, face-to-face, -face, known, uh, is a really important alternative way of establishing legitimacy. And I've seen some very interesting papers about Legitimacy isn't just about input legitimacy, which is who gets voted, but about output legitimacy. And we get these most amazing comments like, um, so what is the trust really? And now and again, what, the last time I gave was to the, to, the, to the luncheon club, which is sort of over 70s and 80s. Very interesting, you know, what the comments that they made. But what is it, what is it exactly, uh, this trust? Are you, are you part of government? And you say, no. Oh, that's a good thing. Which, is a, which actually is a tragic comment on the state of our politics. And it, it really is. That's a very serious issue. But if you say, no, no, we're doing, this is a collective for the community. But they, if you like, they're building their sense of a, of a public and a polity is the community of the area, of the place. So there's some really, really sort of serious issues, I think, about legitimacy. So finally, I better, better, better wrap this up now. Where have we got to on the hypotheses? An expanding activity, probably partly from ideological reasons, but more seriously because there's real practical needs all over the place. And I think it's the practicality of it which is very evident in the initiatives which I notice these days. It's partly an expression of the downsizing of government and pulling out, and people are supposed to be doing self-help. There's a great difference to self-help and individual self-help and a community self-help. They are not the same kinds of self-help. And are, is this, and that's what I think will be really interesting, this is pioneering alternative approaches to the state, to the market. Something about, back to what I said for the um, Bellevue uh, Social Enterprise for Services for the Elderly, achieving quality and efficiency by being small and face-to-face. -face. That's really interesting to say, is how, in that, how far is, is that, how can we really sustain that? The commitment to social responsibility. That was uh, Frank, uh, Frank Moulet's thinking about social innovation. But commitment to responsibility to some social group wider than the individual, wider, wider than the immediate particular interest. And with many different motivations, sometimes ideological, sometimes the group, the sense of we want to do something in the community, and sometimes practical. And something else which people discover, they don't quite realise it. But once they get involved, that a lot of people say, you know, it's, and they don't say it quite in these words, but it's really nice to be involved where you feel you're being useful. Now, that's interesting that humans actually quite like to be useful to somebody outside themselves. And particularly when you've got quite a lot, especially 
the, the people who've got the, the time, and a lot of busy people in the in middle years of life haven't got the time, but people are retiring and around, and they still want, they've still got energy, and have this idea, couldn't I just be useful rather than just sitting around enjoying myself? Not everybody feels like that, I have to say. Oh, no, no, I don't want, I gave up committees when I left work, <laughs> other such things. So I think that's a real, but it's a really interesting motivation, which I come across a number of times. So we can discuss the future, how sustainable, there'll always be, like small businesses, some will succeed and some will fail. Um, a good asset base, stable income, good management, important. Will this enrich democracy? That's coming back to Henk Wagner's, this should, does it? Does it help to connect citizens with governance activity? A little, how much? We need to keep a, dis a distributive uh, consciousness in mind somewhere or other. And I'm very interested, uh, because I suppose in my past I was training professionals, and we have to help all the people who are going into this world professionally, how to learn to be a good community development worker is this really streetwise. How to learn to be streetwise in all these diverse streets. And I think that, that, that will, that's necessary. I, a Dutch uh, uh, official from Rotterdam who was talking at a talk I went to about how she was working with a number of the groups in Rotterdam, she said, I just have to learn to be a disobedient civil servant. <laughs> and I thought, that's, that's it. Find the way, don't follow the rules. <laughs> I think that, that seemed to be the message. Anyway, that's all that I, that's, I've just shared with you what I've been thinking about. So I hope that you found that interesting. Thank you. Thank you.